Hello everybody! In today's video lecture, you are going to learn all about rotational motion. Let's begin with torque and moment of inertia. To move an object, all you have to do is apply a net force. But which case do you think is going to be better to open this door? I think the choice is clearly A. But why? This time, we have to rotate this door about its hinges. And not only where and what direction the force is applied, the location of the axis of rotation will also be important. To turn something, you need to apply a force with leverage, which is called a torque. Our force in this case is applied straight up and the leverage is the distance between the axis of rotation and the application point of the force. Both force and leverage are vector quantities. To get the largest torque for your force, you must apply your force farthest from the axis of rotation. That will give you the most leverage. And also, you need to apply your force with a 90 degree angle to the lever arm. This gives us the torque equation, which is the cross product between the leverage and the force. To find the magnitude of the torque, you have to multiply the leverage and the force magnitudes with the sine of the angle between the two. There are a lot of similarities between the linear motion and rotational motion. The first case is the equilibrium. If the net torque is zero, then the system is balanced, which means it will not accelerate, it will preserve its state of rotation. In this case, both kits are creating forces that are in downward direction, but these forces don't work together, creating a torque they work against each other, such as the, the torque produced by the girl is a counterclockwise direction, whereas the torque produced by the boy is in clockwise direction. Customarily, counterclockwise direction is taken positive. So, if the net torque is zero, this means the magnitude of each torque for boy and girl must be equal to each other. Here's an example problem. We have a uniform plank of 5 meter that sits on two supports and a man moving to the edge of the plank and how far can he go before tipping the planks. Now, we know that when the plank tips it is going to be rotating about this axis right here and it won't be pressing on the other support at all and this is the last point of support like uh, the fulcrum and the other one would be just barely touching there. This means this is my fulcrum right here and this is a balanced torque problem so I know that the net torque must be zero and there are two forces that create the torque. One of them is the mass of the object or the mass with the gravity, it's the weight of the object. One, this is the force of the man and the other one is the weight of the plank and since this is a uniform plank the center of mass should be at its geometrical center and the plank is applying a force from this point right here and I know that the force of the plank is 225 newtons right there. Now since this is exactly in the middle although my drawing is a little off. This should be 2.5 meters. The rest should be 2.5 as well. And since I know that from the support to the edge is 1.1, subtracting 2.5 and 1.1, I find that this distance must be 1.4 meters. So that should be my leverage for the plank. And this unknown is my leverage for the man then. All right. Now let's see, although both forces are downward, their turning effects are opposite to each other. 
So the plank is trying to turn in the counterclockwise direction, so I'll give it a positive designation, and the man's torque is turning in the negative direction then. Okay, this means the torque for the plank minus the torque for the man must be equal to zero, and their values must be equal to each other. So, torque for the plank is equal to torque for the man. So, I know that the torque equation is the lever arm, or the leverage, times the force, times the sine of the angle between the two. Well, the angle is 90 degrees. That's fortunate. And we get lever arm for the man, force for the man, and that's also 90 degrees. So these are just going to be 1. Plugging in values, I have 1.4 meters multiplied with 225 newton equal to 1 um, point, oh I don't know this one, this is leverage of the man multiplied with the weight of the man which is 450 newtons right there. Okay, so this means I need to divide both sides with 450 newtons and the leverage for the man is calculated to be 0 0.7 meters. So this is how far from the, from the support that he is close to he can move. What makes an object harder to start or stop spinning? What makes it more resistive to rotation? What is the common thing between these three events? Let's take a look at them closely. In the first event, we have an axis of rotation which is shown with these dashed lines. And this third choice was the hardest to spin. And by the looks of it, most of these masses are far away from this axis of rotation. For the second case, it was again, the third choice was hardest to spin. This time, the axis of rotation is right here. So the object turn about this axis of rotation. And clearly, the mass is far away from this axis of rotation. And between the three shapes, their axis of rotation goes through their centers. And the hoop has most of its mass away from that axis. Therefore, this resistance to rotation has to do with the arrangement of mass relative to the axis of rotation. Here is another analogy to linear motion. Moment of inertia or rotational inertia. Rotating objects tend to preserve their state of rotation unless a net torque acts on them. Sounds just like Newton's first law, isn't it? This is Newton's first law for rotation. Like inertia, rotational inertia depends on mass but also distribution of mass about an axis of rotation. Greater the distance of most of the mass from the axis of rotation, greater the moment of inertia. The answer here is B, but a lot of people think the option C is more compact, therefore it should have the least inertia. But where is the axis of rotation? It goes right in the middle. And when you look at it, the distance from the axis of rotation is larger for this skater than it was on B. So, if the skater was doing a tumble, then C would be the 
the, the least inertia case. But since it is spinning around this vertical axis, the answer is clearly B. The equation for moment of inertia for an object whose radius is small compared to its distance can be found using I for moment of inertia equal to m r squared. r is the distance between the axis of rotation and the mass. Rotational inertia formula varies with the shape and the axis of rotation's position. As we can see here, between the three shapes, sphere has the least moment of inertia and hoop has the most. Therefore, it is more resistive to rotating between the three shapes. In most of the cases, we use one of the moment of inertia equations that are given to us, but sometimes we get to calculate the moment of inertia based on an axis. So I would like to give you an idea about how the calculation is done. We have two cases here, two objects with masses m attached at the ends of a let's say lightweight massless rod. In the first case they are turning about an axis on one side and in the second case the, they are turning about an axis in the middle of them. So what would be their moment of inertia for each case? Let's work on case A first. So we need to find a sum of all the mr squares for this system of two objects. So the first one, m1, so it is m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared needs to be calculated. So that's the, that's the moment of inertia. So as we can see that the radius for the first mass is just zero. So there's nothing there. And the radius for the second object is L. So it is M2, which is the same thing as just M. So M, and we put L for the radius, ML squared. So the moment of inertia for the first case is equal to ML squared. Now let's take a look at it for the second case. We need to find the sum of all m r squares again. So m1 times r1 squared plus m2 times r2 squared. So m times uh, r1 is l over 2 so it makes l over 2 squared plus m times l over 2 squared again which makes l squared over 4 as you know. So if I add the two of them, I will have 2ml squared over 4s, which will give me ml squared over 2. Now, as you see, on case B, we have half the rotational inertia than uh, compared to case 1. So for spheres or other objects or irregularly shaped objects, this calculation must be done for each segment of it. It is usually done using integral calculus. But for the scope of this course, we are going to either calculate the moment of inertia for simple uh, distribution of masses or we will use one that is pre-calculated for us.